Okay, uh, welcome to the Google Chat, everyone. It's great to, to see you guys and interact with you guys. We had a lot of great questions last time. <clears throat> I'm uh, Dr. Jacob Wilson. This is Ryan Lowry, the, um, one of the top scientists in the world, actually, in this field right now. He's killing it. And um, you're in our, actually, reaction time and metabolic lab right now. So mm -hmm. we're doing a lot of studies in this lab looking at, like, what's the impact of breakfast, for example, on programming your metabolism? What's the impact of changing your macronutrients on metabolism? So you're right here. There's a lot of action happening here. So let's go ahead and start off um, <clears throat> with the first question. Is What's the first question? Yeah, so it's from Hank. Uh, Hank says, now that I'm about to be done dieting, what's the best way to get my metabolism back up? Okay, Hank. So now that I'm done dieting, what's the best way to get my metabolism back up? To be honest with you, that's like the age-old question. That's the question that a lot of people talk about. You know, you hear things like reverse dieting, right? Well, how many studies have been done on reverse dieting? <laughs> None, right? But, you know, there's whole books written on it. Nothing. So it's a difficult question. And what I can tell you is that when you have dieted for a long time, like we all know your metabolism lowers. But it seems like your metabolism probably, uh, even on drastic diet, probably won't lower more than like 18%. 15 18%, which is still a lot, don't get me wrong. But the question is, what is that? Well, that's an adaptation. All right, it's an adaptation that your body's like, whoa, 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 I got to conserve calories. What's causing that adaptation? What's causing that adaptation is the fact that you're in a calorie deficit. Okay? So the other thing we know is this. <clears throat> Say you were to cut your calories by like 1,000. Say you started off at 2,500. Um, and now you did a drastic diet, you're at 1,500. If you were to maintain that 1,500 calorie uh, uh, amount, your metabolism might actually continue to go down. All right? So your body can just adapt. It, can, it keeps going down and down to a calorie deficit. So one of the things people might do is they might, like, reverse diet out, for example. I'm going to go 1,600 calories now um, for, like, a week. Um, then I'll do 1,700. Um, and that will get my metabolism up. But you got to realize, if that's still a calorie deficit, if that 1,600 calories is still a calorie deficit, if that 1,700 calories is still a calorie deficit, and you're trying to sustain it, guess what's going to happen to your metabolism? It's going to keep going down. Mm -hmm. So you got to kind of find what your, <clears throat> your new maintenance is obviously not going to be the same as your old maintenance. So you're not going to be able to jump up to your calories that you were before right away. But you probably don't want to maintain it too slow a reverse you probably want to go to your new maintenance, whatever, which is the point where you're not gaining or losing weight. You want to get up to that probably within two weeks. So you stop these adaptations that are happening. So the real question is, how do you get up, get back up to that? And um, <clears throat> uh, one of the things is you have to introduce calories that are likely not as efficient. And I know that's what Ryan's been looking into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Dr. Wilson said, you got to introduce calories that really aren't efficient at, at fat gain. Um, so one of those cal one of those macronutrients is protein, right? So there's been studies by Dr. Joey Antonio where they've even overfed on protein, and you don't see any fat gain. So if you're trying to get your calories back up to the new maintenance that Dr. Wilson mentioned, one of the ways you can start doing that is by increasing your protein substantially, uh, getting your protein back up and bumping those calories up with protein. And that's going to be really important. Yep, so once you've done that, then maybe you can reestablish a normal macronutrient range. So by introducing sort of these inefficient calories, you're not going to get fat on protein. So raising your calories protein is going to be another way. One thing, and, and um, actually we'll, we're, we're going to know this next week, yeah. um, we're doing one of the first sort of reverse dieting type of studies where we're actually taking people. It's happening right now. we got one week left in the study. We dieted people down. <clears throat> now when you diet down hard, your body preferentially, when you get really lean, uses muscle as fuel, or uh, use muscle, uh, you lose it at a much faster rate when you're really lean, and when you come out of the diet, you preferentially store fat. But what if you could change your metabolism so you're using fat primarily as fuel? Our experiment right now is looking where we diet people down, a normal carb, high protein diet, we switch them over to a ketogenic high fat diet. So we think is even though your metabolism is low, because you're using fat preferentially as fuel, you may not gain fat back. We don't know the answer to that. I suspect it will work, but our next uh, Google Hangout will let you know the results of that on BodyMall.com before anyone else does know. Okay, next question. Uh, Rosie. Hey, Jacob. I'm so happy to be a part of this. First off, my question is, last week I haven't 
been going to the gym due to a horrible sinus infection. I hope you're feeling better now. That's that's a shame. But now that I have a short period of time, what do you recommend for results for the next few days? Okay, here's the thing, um, Rosie. One of the things that a lot of people will do is they'll come out of a cold. They'll come out of a time where they traveled. They'll come out of a time where maybe they went to the Arnold Classic, you know, um, and kind of binged or whatever, and they'll go, oh, my God, i got to make up for, like, three weeks worth of work. i got to make up this week and, and uh, two weeks worth of time in one single week. And what ends up happening is that <clears throat> you end up going backwards when you do that. My advice is to get back on your program that was working and just go the rest of the distance. You know, I think being strict on your diet like you were before, being strict on your training – will get you the best results, and that's sustainable results. Um, of course, you know the tips that we have. Interval training is going to be key. Uh, higher training frequency, spreading out your volume, not just hitting a body part once a week, maybe at least three times a week, that's going to be key. Um, and, you know, starting your day off with, like, a low-carb breakfast. Those would be the tips exactly. I have. Exactly. Just get back on it. Get back <clears throat> on it and keep moving forward. Um, oh, here's a good one. Oh. Here's a good one by Ryan Weaver. Uh, here we go. Is powerlifting the same as bodybuilding for muscle growth? Um, in short, no. Um, <laughs> all right, so I know, again, I know right now all the questions are, whoa, they're all controversial. What's going on here? <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Um, the, it's, it's real important to sort of understand this. Can powerlifting build muscle? Absolutely. There's no question about it. Can you get big powerlifting? Absolutely. There's no question about it. Is it the same as bodybuilding? No. Okay? So let me let me explain what it is. We've done studies where we've taken bodybuilders and they switched over to pure, pure powerlifting. Like where they weren't doing 8 to 12 reps anymore. They weren't doing short rest period lengths. And I, I kid you not. I kid you not. We've seen like their deadlift go up from 500 to 560 pounds. I've seen their squat go up from 400 to like 440 their bench go up from like 315 to 330 on the course of a study where we mainly focus just on powerlifting. And all their lifts went up. We put them on our DEXA where we scan them, and they got fatter and they lost muscle. Okay? Now, am I saying that's going to happen to you? No. What I'm saying is that powerlifting primarily maximizes one mechanism of hypertrophy, and that is <clears throat> load. That's mechanical stress. When you talk about a bodybuilder, they should be optimizing all the mechanisms of hypertrophy, which are metabolic stress, you have cell swelling, and the mechanical tension. Yeah, so it's all of those things oh. combined. Now, what I want to emphasize, though, is that a lot of people will say, oh, well, if I get stronger, I'll be able to train um, um, heavier in a hypertrophy range. Theoretically, that is absolutely correct. However, a one repetition maximum in a squat a run repetition maximum in a bench, when done properly, is 100% different than doing a set of 12 uh, with short rest period le length when your purpose is to damage the muscle. So for a bench press, let's take for example, your number one purpose is to make the movement as efficient as possible. All right? So what does that mean? You're going to arch your back. You're going to pinch your shoulder blades together. You're going to drive with your feet. You're going to shorten the distance from your chest all the way out. And so th what you're doing is you're lowering the distance of the movement. When you lower the distance of, of the movement, you lift heavier. Mm -hmm. But research from Carlo Ugrin Carlos Ugrinowitz, a good friend of mine, has shown that long and also um, out of Cal State Fullerton's done, done research on that. Lee Brown's lab's done work on this. Longer range of motion results in more hypertrophy gains, more growth. So if you're shortening the range of motion on a bench, is that ideal for bodybuilding? No. Can I get stronger doing it the inefficient way where I'm, my back is more flat and I'm creating a longer range of motion? Yes, and therefore I can train uh, more in a hypertrophy range. But it's different because for bodybuilding, you want the length, length, range of motion to be longer. You want to make the motion more inefficient. You know, If I'm doing a squat, I'm not going to necessarily push my stomach into the belt to give me drive on the way up because that detracts from my quads, okay? So you have to understand it's a, it's a skill movement and it's different. So you can lift heavy in a less efficient way 
to build yourself in a hypertrophy range compared to powerlifting, which you're trying to optimize efficiency. Totally different. Yeah, and there's actually a great study by Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, one of our colleagues, that compared the two type of the lifting styles. He had one group do powerlifting, and he had one group do more of like a bodybuilding type routine. At the end of the study, he saw no differences in muscle growth. So people look at that study and say, well, I could either do powerlifting or I could either do bodybuilding and get the same amount of muscle growth. But the, it's in the details where you really got to look. And basically what he found is, and in his study, they matched for total training volume. <clears throat> well, what that means is a bodybuilding type routine, guess how long it took? 15 minutes. 15 minutes compared to the powerlifting routine, which took over an hour. So, of course, of course you're not going to see any differences, right? The bodybuilders were only training for 15 minutes. Powerlifters are training for longer, over an hour. Imagine if you had a regular bodybuilder, which is an hour, hour and a half, two hours sometimes. Do you think there would be differences then? I mean, that's a study that definitely needs to be done, but that was a great landmark study to show that when volume's equated, yeah, maybe we might not see any differences. But for a typical bodybuilding routine, who's going to work out for 15 minutes? Yeah. So that's important to keep in mind. It's very, very true. And one of the things that we found is a lot of people will come out of a bodybuilding contest and say, I'm just going to do pure powerlifting for a few months um, and not really train like a bodybuilder in hope of putting on size. Based on what I've seen in the lab, you're going to, you, you know, Granted, there's genetic freaks out there who are big and huge and really strong and do both, and they're making gains. I'm not saying you can't, but you won't optimize gains. If you do switch to powerlifting, you need to still incorporate bodybuilding type training in there. And you might not optimize your powerlifting, but you can't remove the things like metabolic stress. You can't remove the 8 to 12 repetition type of training, the one-minute rest. You got to keep that in there while you're powerlifting if you want to optimize all the growth patterns, and that that's my best advice to you. So going off metabolic stress, this is a real great question from Jesse. Um, should I unwrap between sets on blood flow restriction exercise? Um, and this is this is a great question. Something we get a lot. Uh, a lot of people like start to feel the pain when they're doing blood flow restriction, and <clears> they <throat> take it off in between each exercise. Well, there was a great study done by uh, Dr. Jeremy Lenicky. And basically, they did this exact study. They had people take it off in between um, each set. And basically, what they found was the metabolic stress, that lactate buildup, which we know triggers the growth response, wasn't as high when you took it off in between each set. So no, you should keep it on. Say you're doing, say you're doing leg press or say you're doing leg extension and you're doing the typical 30 repetitions, 15, 15, 15. You keep it on throughout the entire time uh, un until you're done. Uh, you don't. As soon as the pain starts coming, as soon as the the metabolic stress starts coming, you want to keep that on. That's the whole point of blood flow restriction. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, this is actually the first guy <laughs> to ever do a study using practical blood flow restriction. So all the labs use a ten thousand dollar device, which is like called the Katsu, and it's actually like a very advanced blood pressure cuff. But this guy's the first guy to look at practical blood flow restriction and directly look at skeletal muscle hypertrophy. We knew. That, like Linicky's done some great research on um, like practical blood flow restriction. The first documented hypertrophy was uh, was Lowry here, so <laughs> historical. <laughs> uh, here we go. Um, here's another one from Hank. Uh, great question. When going keto, is it net carbs or total carbs that should be concerned with? Uh, that's a that's a really great question um, and something that we we honestly don't have a clear answer. But what we can tell you is this. Um, based on some of the stuff and based on a lot of the blood that we've gotten uh, in the lab, it's kind of a combination of both. Um, and this is really important to remember because if you have 50 grams of, of Lucky Charms, that's going to 50 grams of carbohydrates coming from Lucky Charms, that's going to be completely different from 50 grams coming from vegetables, right? The 50 grams from Lucky Charms might throw you out of ketosis. Um, so it's going to be a it's going to be a combination of you. You do need that fiber. And that's going to be really important. That's one of the things that we preach when we're when we're talking about people and putting people on a ketogenic diet is fiber becomes important because your carbohydrate amount is so low that you need to get them primarily from like leafy greens, uh, things like broccoli, spinach, all these things. Those should be your primary sources of carbohydrates. You shouldn't be like, oh, well, I have 40 grams of carbohydrates left. It fits my macros, so I'm going to go out and have some kind of sugar. Or something like that. No, no. I mean, it, it, you don't don't go have that ice cream. Instead, fill your day out with vegetables. Get your fiber in.
and that's going to be really important for keeping you truly in ketosis. Yeah, exactly. So that's why you know you got to be real careful with like the uh, IFYM on keto. That's for sure. Um, but the the main thing is like like Ryan said, one thing that we would definitely recommend. I guess one easy way to go if if you've never done ketogenic dieting, um, start off by just saying total carbs. All right, and those carbs should be fibrous. Once you find you're in a niche and you're hitting ketosis, you're measuring it, you're in, go ahead and, and, and play with it and say, all right, my net carb, net carbs are going to be. And if you stay in ketosis, great, because you're eating high-fiber foods, maybe you can get your carbs up to 50, you know? Or if you're our good friend Lawrence Ballinger, <laughs> you get your carbs up to 200, right? <laughs> um, but if you're not, then um, <clears throat> I would suspect that I would start off with total carbs and then see as you can play around with the net, and maybe you can get your carbs a little bit higher. Um, so, so as always, be your own scientist. Be your own scientist. Be your own scientist. Collect data. <laughs> uh, here's a good one from Ryan. Uh, should I train to failure on every set? Okay, so you know it's an interesting talk. My my brother, Dr. Gabe Wilson, uh, really got me looking at this. He published a paper on this in Journal of Strength Conditioning Research a while back. Um, so what is train to failure? All right, train to failure, uh, everyone knows, right? You can't get another rep. That's going to be concentric failure. Another failure that, um, like, <laughs> that's pretty harsh, too, is negative failure. So, um... We did some this morning yeah, this, on back. Yeah, we did uh, negative failure on back. That's where, basically, you go to failure. We didn't have much time because of an experiment. We're doing a muscle damage experiment. So <laughs> we only, we only a little bit of time, so we had to create a lot of muscle damage quick. And one way to do that, we did um, negative failure. So basically that means that um, you you basically, if someone helps you the weight up, it's just going to come down. You can't even hold it. So most people when are talking about failure are talking about <clears throat> normal failure training. Okay, One thing I, I want to point out is that people talk a lot about central fatigue. Okay, um, Right now, for example, I have a lot of central fatigue because I've like, only slept like three hours a night this week, which is not good. Don't follow what I do. <laughs> Um, you know, but central fatigue is basically, um, uh, means that your brain and your nervous system, like your spinal cord, can't recruit, can't activate your muscle tissue as well. You start to feel a little bit cranky, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, so one of the things to understand is that, um, it, you, you basically, you can't activate as much muscle. If you can't activate the fat switch muscle fibers, you're not going to be as strong, there's as much hypertrophy, etc. What are the advantages of failure? The advantage of failure is that you recruit initially all of your muscle, okay? And you get it to fire really rapidly, and you get it to adapt. The negative, I guess, the, the side effect is central fatigue. It does exist. So basically what it means is that your nervous system is taxed when it has to maximally recruit all of its muscle, all right? So that happens both during the workout and the next day. So when we measure central fatigue in our lab, looking at like electromyography or something called twitch interpolation, um, basically what ends up what we see is that the person can't activate as much tissue during and the next day. Now what happens is this. <clears throat> it's very important to understand how you program failure. Failure is important, but how you program it is critical. Say you're doing four sets of bench press or five sets of bench press. If you fail on set one and you can do a set of ten, you will get central fatigue and set two you might only be able to get six reps, okay? So, but if you did it, and then the next set maybe five, and then five, okay? So you got you got basically ten, six, five, and five. But what if on the first set, instead of failing at ten, maybe you got nine? Then the next set you can get nine again. The next set maybe you get eight, and the last set you hit failure with eight. You hit it, you get all the benefits of failure, but you got all the volume from the previous sets. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we want to emphasize on failures. How you program it is important. Likely use it on the last set. When we talk about doing strip sets, likely use that as a finisher. Because strip sets, um, a good friend of mine out of Finland, um, Juha Ahotinen, uh, one of the best guys out of, um, actually he's out of Hakkinen's lab in Yavaskula, Finland. If you look up a hot and he's done some of the best research there are on training variables. What he found <clears throat> is that when you do do strip sets, you get even more central fatigue, um, more stress hormones increase. And so but basically what that means is that that's going to be at a narrow level. 
So you need to program that for the end of the workout as sort of a finisher. Um, and finally, realize that not every workout might be performed a complete failure because um, then you might get into issues. So, you know, maybe on your hypertrophy days, failure is going to cause the most metabolic stress. You know, um, you could do a lot more failure training. Or, you know, but on your strength days, be as sparingly as possible with them. We're not, definitely not hitting failure like the last set or maybe just one exercise. So the point is, use it as a tool to be careful. Hey, um, great, great. So Angela asked a question here. Should I keep taking pre and post supplements all the time? I hear it's good to take a break every four months, at least for four weeks to start over. Uh, is that right? I work out four or six times a week. Um, it's honestly going to depend on the on the supplement, to be quite honest. Things like protein, things like branched chain amino acids, things like creatine really don't need to be cycled at all. Um, those are things that you can keep taking probably for the, from now to the rest of your life. Um, and they're good to take for the rest of your life. One of the things that we talk about a lot with creatine <clears throat> is that eventually we, we honestly think it's no longer going to be considered a supplement. It's going to be considered a nutrient. Uh, that's how important creatine is. I mean, we're finding creatine's always gotten a rap like, for bodybuilders, like, hey, it can build muscle, but all of its cognitive effects now are just astounding. More and more are coming out for its effects on, on cognitive performance, um, which is great. So those three things definitely don't need to be cycled. Things like stimulants, yes, absolutely. I think those should be cycled. Uh, things like arginine, if you're taking an arginine-based supplement, should it be cycled? Yeah, I think so, absolutely, because with those two things, with the stimulants, like Dr. Wilson talked about earlier, with the central... Um, nervous system, you're taxing it over and over and over again with stimulants. Um, you're just ramping it up over and over, releasing a ton of, of like adrenaline every time you go into your workout. Those should be cycled. Um, you don't want to keep ramping up your nervous system every single time. Things like arginine are important because we, the more and more you take arginine, the more and more you build up an enzyme known as arginase, which breaks down arginine. So that's why sometimes when you take an arginine product, you take it for the first week, you feel fantastic. The next week, you're like, oh, I'm not getting that same response. Well, you're building up arginase. And so you have to take two scoops. Next week, maybe three scoops. So eventually, there's going to become a point where it's like, oh, I'm not getting the same effect that I had first week. Well, that's where it might be a good time to, to cycle off that, kind of down-regulate that en enzyme of arginase and, and try and go back at it in a few weeks. So that's, that would be my point. Yeah, I 100% agree. I mean, some of it's, I think, you take your whole life. Yeah. Uh, that's actually my dissertation when I was doing my <laughs> doctorate. I gave uh, you can't do lifelong studies on humans, obviously, or we would I wouldn't be here by the end of it. Uh, but we gave rats HMB their whole life. We published it in the <clears throat> journal of the International Society of Sport and Nutrition. Just look up rats, Jacob Wilson. Uh, and Journal of International said, and honestly, we, we found that like the rats who uh, took HMB their whole life were like a lot leaner. Um, they didn't get fat from young to middle age. When they were old, they maintained a lot of their muscles. Some of them were super lean. Like, um, yeah. so yeah, and you know, unless you're talking about like, hormones and stimulants and stuff like that, I would. Mm -hmm. uh, no reason to do that. Nope. Uh, here's another great question. Oh, here we go. Uh, if I want to increase a certain body part, like chest, um, should I just stick to regular bench pressing every day? Uh, what's more important for periodization, changing reps, weight, or something else? All right. So this is really a great question. Um, here's the thing to sort of understand. So you think you talk about periodization. All right, what is periodization? Periodization, by definition, is programmed change. Programmed change, okay? So what does that mean? It's not... You, you're not going to the gym and going, oh, uh, what do you want to hit today? And, like, I uh, want to do super set, giant set, uh, you know, oh, you, what do you feel like doing? But, you know, it's not, it's a plan, okay? So, <clears throat> strangely enough, as, as, mu as, as amazing as it is, most of the studies that have been done have been looking at changing sets, reps, rest period lengths with the same exercise selection, okay? Um... The, there's only one study that's looked at changing exercises. And basically, our lab published this along with, um, actually it was headed up by someone in our lab, um, Dr. Eduardo de Souza. So we brought him over 
as a postdoc researcher from Brazil. And what, uh, what basically Dr. Eduardo de Sousa did uh, was he, we looked at changing exercises versus changing reps on strength, on strength. We found the most effective way to increase strength and hypertrophy was actually changing exercises over just changing reps. Now, the combination of the two is going to be important. The thing to understand is if you're according to the law of specificity, if I want to get better at bench pressing, I have to bench press, okay? However, you are exposed to the same stimulus over and over and over and over again, you will no longer adapt to that stimulus, which means you need to provide variation. Now, those two things seem to contradict each other, but you can still provide variation on the bench press by changing up your grip, by changing up the angle, incline, a, you know, 35 degree, 45 degree, steep incline, flat, decline. You know, you, you could even use things like dumbbell bench. Changing that exercise selection will result in greater strength adaptations. You're making the environment different. You're forcing your nervous system to adapt. And so, <clears throat> uh, basically, I would recommend using a combination of periodizing with exercises and reps. So what you could do is for a month, for example, you could um, periodize the reps where you start off week one um, where you're going relatively lighter and higher volume. By week four, you're going really heavy and then you change the exercise up on week five. That's what we've done in our studies. And we've gotten some of the biggest gains in our studies. Um, you know, we posted on the, at the Muscle Prof Instagram, if you check that out, uh, some of the results. We took the scans from our results, and the gains were insane. Why? Because we are not just doing like what other labs are doing. We're changing the exercises and the reps, and we're doing it every single week so that the body has no chance but to adapt. So again, a combination of both, but stay specific. D dumbbell flies are not going to make your bench go up, right? But using chains on the bench, using different angles, will make your bench press go up. So a combination. Perfect. Love it. All right. Uh, Rachel asks, what are the most effective ratios, uh, low, moderate, and high, for carb cycling for fat loss? Uh, this is a great question, Rachel, and, and honestly, we don't have very many studies, if, if any at all, on carb cycling. Um, something that we definitely want to do uh, in the future, but what, what I will say is this. Um, you want to program it based on your workout week. Uh, so if you're doing, obviously, low would be on your off days and high would be on your, your brutal workout days. One of the things that we recommend in Project Mass is somewhere from like 3 to 5 grams per kilo. Um, and that's for Project Matt. So you can you can kind of base it off of off of that recommendation, three to five. I would never really say, unless you're like an, an elite endurance athlete, that you would ever need to go over that amount for carbohydrates. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of data that seems to support that, uh, that you don't really need to go anywhere over three to five grams per kilogram. Uh, so I would I would I would say never go really unless you're going keto. Uh, never go below one. But so anywhere from like one to five grams per kilo, I think would be a, a great recommendation. Yeah. So the question really becomes like um, you talk about carb cycling, but I'm talking about calorie cycling in general. Those are two concepts that get thrown out a lot. And again, it's un it, it's unfortunate that we just don't have a lot of data on it. What I can tell you is <clears throat> we have to sort of piece together from the literature what you might do and what's the benefit to carb cycling. One thing I will tell you is this. We do know, and Ryan and I have been doing a lot of research on this concept known as insulin sensitivity. What is insulin sensitivity? Insulin sensitivity is your muscle's ability, your muscle's ability to respond to the hormone insulin. What does insulin do? Insulin basically goes to the muscle, talks to it, and says, hey, take glucose up. Take carbohydrates in the cell. All right? That's insulin sensitivity. Question is, what increases insulin sensitivity. The, one of the answers is that um, you have to activate a sensor inside of your muscles. Uh, it's, it's basically the cell's fuel gauge. Um, and most people haven't heard of it, but it's called AMPK. Forget AMPK, just realize you have a cell fuel gauge. When that cell senses I'm low in fuel, it says, oh, I don't have any carbs. I better increase what? Mitochondria. Mitochondria is where we burn fat. If you're a bodybuilder, you want a lot of mitochondria. The more mitochondria you have, the better your insulin sensitivity is. 
So how do we trigger that? We got to lower have periods of time where your carbohydrate stores are low. We do know there's research um, that's been done basically um, where essentially what they end up doing is they go periods of time where they'll train in a high carbohydrate state, okay, and then what they'll end up doing is they'll deplete, they won't reintroduce carbs until after their next training session, and during that training session they'll train in a depleted state and they get more mitochondrial adaptations, okay? So, um, so anyway, so the point is that that would be the benefit of carbohydrate cycling if, you're, if your goal is body composition to where if you're doing intervals one day, if you are trained in sort of a depleted state, you might trigger those adaptations. Uh, research has also shown that if I were to go do interval training, provide a ton of carbs around the interval, I never make that cell fuel gauge go, oh, what happened? I'm low on energy. So it has no reason to increase mitochondria, no reason to increase fat burning metabolism, no reason to increase insulin sensitivity. And in fact, having carbs high all the time at the high range, like Ryan said, at five kilograms a day, could cut. One thing we do know is having a carbohydrate overfeeding in as little as three days starts to cause insulin resistance, which is the opposite of insulin sensitivity. Okay? So my point is that <clears throat> that could be a benefit. Now, as, as far as what we know, like Ryan said, three grams per kilogram could be on your low days. Um, fought, which would be like, you know, uh, I don't know, shoulder day, shoulder arm day. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing leg day, you might have a higher amount of carbs. The other thing that you want to take into consideration, I know I'm becoming a little bit complex here, but um, there are different types of exercise that make you insulin sensitive, and there are certain types that make you more insulin resistant. High amounts of muscle damage make you temporarily insulin resistant. So if you go and you do very heavy leg workout and lots of volume and you can't walk the next day, you have a lot of inflammation and a lot of damage, you actually won't respond to carbs as well. You won't be as sensitive to carbs at that point because you're damaging the tissue, you're damaging the muscle, and it won't be as responsive. It's not functioning as well. When you do more metabolic training, um, which like Brad Schoenfeld talks a lot about, <clears throat> 8 to 12 reps, short rest period lengths, you're not lifting as heavy, it's more metabolic stress, more the pump, insulin sensitivity will go up. When you're doing interval training, insulin sensitivity will go up. That could be times when your carbohydrates are higher and you're closer to the 5 grams. So the range is 3 to 5, um, and uh, that would be my advice on, on, on carb cycling uh, yeah. to this date on what we currently have. Absolutely. And, and t like Dr. Wilson said, timing becomes important. If you want to, if that, that depleted state, if that's an adaptation you want to make, then certainly timing is going to be key. Um, so, yeah, great, great question. Really good question. Um, here's a here's a great one by Colin. Uh, this is something we both have done in the past. Uh, what do you think about waking up in the middle of the night and drinking a quick protein shake and going back to bed? Uh, is there a benefit of doing that? All right, um, <clears throat> Colin. Here's here's what it comes down to, and I'd like to be honest with it with you guys. This is this is why this is why like for you guys out there who are like into exercise science or into nutrition. Um, we need you to go out and do studies like this. Yes. We need people who, where, like for us, we lose sleep. Why am I getting three hours a night of sleep? Because I'm thinking about this stuff and I can't sleep. Or I'm trying, like, you know what? How do you get people huge? How do you get people shredded? We don't have enough scientists that are losing sleep over this. And because of that, we unfortunately don't have a study on that. However, what we do know from Luke Van Loon's lab is they gave protein in the they gave protein before bed um, and went and looked at protein synthesis while you were sleeping and your body can stimulate muscle growth protein synthesis in the middle of the night just like it can in the day okay so based on that research I would say <clears throat> and based on my brother dr. Gabe Wilson's research and and others, we know that when you, um, after about three hours after a meal, you stop synthesizing proteins, okay? So if you woke up in the middle of the night and you had a shake, um, you would turn protein synthesis back on. And so um, that could be very beneficial to, to do. I, I think the important thing to keep in mind with that, too, it, it definitely it definitely can be beneficial. But make sure, if, if that's something you're doing, you're getting an adequate amount of sleep. So say if you're like us... Um, and again, this isn't this isn't what you should do. But if you're like us and you're getting like under five hours 
of sleep a night, then waking up in the middle, you need to you need as much of that sleep that you can. Waking up in the middle of the night may not be beneficial for for us to do that because we're going to cause other things like like. And we're, we might become insulin resistant because we know that lower amounts of sleep, lower amounts of, of recovery from that sleep can cause things like insulin resistance. And that's why when we're sleeping, we need to get the most out of that sleep. Um, but if someone who's sleeping eight or nine hours really maximizing that sleep potential, who knows? This, this may be a fantastic idea. And it's really something that we've, we've talked about for years and really needs to be tested. Yep. Great, great, great point. So, um, and yeah, sleep is very, very, very important. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, oh, here's a here's a great one. Uh, here's a great one by Chase. Uh, is is there a limit to growth? <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, that was actually a question that we got um, recently. So basically, and we need to answer this question. And, you know, and you remember for you guys who watch Generation Iron, all right? Um, and this is something that we've been talking about a lot in our lab. Right. Remember, remember the quote, Generation Iron, right? Is there a limit to growth? Well, certainly there's a limit. I just don't know that we found it, right? Okay, so the, one of the biggest questions we have is, how much muscle can you put on? How much muscle can, can you put on? It's, I mean, it's something that we get asked all the time. People, people will go on. Uh, we've seen a lot recently of uh, people trying to go on and say, well, there's, there's a maximum amount that you can gain. And that maximum amount is is about six kilos, uh, and that's if you go six point one kilos, it's it's impossible. You can't do it. It's yeah. absolutely impossible. Yeah. Um, which which baffles me. And you want to talk about the story? Yeah. So basically, that that is first of all, the stat statement there is false, right? But okay. So we're really we're going controversial. We're going to keep going with it. We're going to roll with it right now. Okay. Um, here's the thing, guys. <clears throat> Before 1954, all right. They looked at Roger Bannister, okay, and or before Roger Bannister in 1954, they said that you couldn't break the four-minute mile, all right. And um, scientists, I, I lecture in, in a university setting, okay. If I was teaching a physiology course, I would be lecturing to my students before 1954 that it was humanly, physiologically impossible to run faster than a four-minute mile. It will never be done. People did doctoral dissertations. You got to realize some of my colleagues. It took them seven to eight years to get their doctorate. I remember going to my doctor, doctoral program. I had to I'm like, what year are you in? Oh, I'm in my seventh year. I'm like, man, this is going to be a long program. <laughs> they did their whole dissertation basically on showing you can't break the four-minute mile. Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile, and since that time, tw over 20,000 people have broken that, including high school um, students. All right. So why am I going off on this tangent? When you set limits, especially scientists, it's something we better be real careful with because we don't know the limit to growth, okay? So what you, what I want to point out to you really quick is that when you look at published studies, what you're seeing is the average. So if you look and you see a six kilogram increase in a study, what does that mean? That's the average. And when you, when you train subjects, you will see non-responders who make no gains. But if you had a six kilogram increase, I guarantee you some people were making 10 to 12 kilogram increases in that 10 week period of time. You don't see that data because you only see the average. So what's happening with the people making 12 kilograms? On our Instagram the other day, we showed, we showed four scans. Can't fake this. You take four scans. We scan them. We took the raw data, put it on the screen. There were three people on that that gained over four kilograms in four weeks of lean mass. One person gained over 6.5 kilograms of lean mass in four weeks. Now, you people would say that was impossible. That's all you can do in 12 weeks. Then why do we have a scan live showing 6.5 kilograms of lean mass going up in four weeks? Because it is possible. The question is, how do you get it and how do you get it consistently? Okay? Well, one, we don't know the limit to growth. I don't know your limit to growth. Okay? What I'm saying is everyone has a genetic potential. We do know that. We know some people respond better than training to others. But look at people who are elite athletes. Look at these NFL football players. Okay? Some of these people are 300 pounds. How did they get to that point? Not by looking at averages in a study. So what I'm saying is that when you start reading posts that say you can't accomplish something, oh, you can only put on a pound of muscle or two pounds of muscle in a month, I don't know that I would buy that and I wouldn't put that limitation because the limitation that you set for yourself 
is what you're going to probably get. Okay? So, you that might be your limit genetically. I don't know. But don't set that limit until you've done enough experimentation and been your own scientist to find that out. So that's my answer to that question. Oh. Still don't know the limit. All right. Still don't know the limit. Um, let's see. This is a good one. Uh, here by Arpe. I have been working out pretty intensely for the past 11 weeks. Uh, since the past week, I have been feeling more and more fatigued. I'm on a caloric deficit. I'm not sure if I should take a break from my workout or increase my caloric intake. So this is this is a great question, and um, something you might want to do is is really rank your be be very honest with yourself um, and rank yourself on a, on a scale. One of the scales that we use in the lab is um, the rate of perceived recovery scale, the perceived recovery scale status, and basically it's a scale of, of zero of one to ten, and ten means that you're ready to hit it. You can go through the wall. Clearly, clearly, that, that doesn't seem how like you're feeling right now. Uh, a one is like you can barely get out of bed. You're probably sick. You can't. It's it's hard to move. It's the worst you've ever felt in your life. Be very honest with yourself. If you on that scale, if you're below a six, then it may be some. It may be a good time to cut back, to really taper. Um, and Dr. Wilson really is like the expert on on really how to cut back and, and taper your training to allow you to try and rebound and get back up to that 9, uh, 8, 9, or 10 on that scale. Yeah, exactly right. But one of the things, and, and that's exactly right, you, you need to basically do this auto-regulatory training. Um, and that's very, very important. <clears throat> if you're extremely fatigued, like Ryan said, that's why the taper could be very important. One thing I will say is that if um, you're, you're putting here that um, you've been on a calorie deficit for a long time, like 11 weeks. I know, Ryan, um, you saw a study the other day um, that was brought up um, the other day, basically, where they did calorie cycling. I was actually pretty excited about this study, um, where basically, do you want to explain the study? You can do it. Okay. So basically what they did was they ate strict on a diet mm -hmm. for, I think it was 10 days. Yep. Strict on their diet, okay? So say they were eating... 1,500 calories a day. I'm not telling you to go that long, but this is what they're doing in the study. 1,500 calories a day. One group sustained 1,500 calories a day the entire um, the entire duration of the study. One group after 10 days was allowed to not track their calories and just eat normal. What they ended up doing was roughly eat around 19 to 2,000 calories for was it two to three days? Two to three days. Two to three days where they could eat normal. That group who basically did that was um, lost more total fat, and the more the other important thing is the group that cycled their calories. The more important thing is when they came off of the diet, and brought these people back into the lab. Um, several weeks later. <clears throat> several weeks later, the people who had done the calorie cycling were able to sustain that fat loss. So I guess what I would recommend to you is that something similar. I would follow what Ryan's saying on auto regulatory, but you might. Give yourself a little break on your calories that you put. Should I, should, I, should I a little break for my workout? You should periodize your workout. But yeah, you should probably give yourself two to three days every um, every ten days to recoup a little bit, or program in so you have one to two days a week. Where you're kind of going back up to maintenance, mm -hmm. um, and that's what I would say. And, and one of the things we've been getting out, there's a lot of questions here about peaking for this final week um, coming up with pictures and things like that. The one thing that we want to get across is is this this is just the beginning. I mean, this is just the beginning of your guys' lifestyle change. Uh, and we uh, some of the pictures and some of the progress that we've seen is phenomenal. And we couldn't be we couldn't be prouder and, and happier for you guys uh, on your journey. So just remember it. Don't try and crash down and get really uh, just ruin your ruin yourself these last couple days or last week to try and peak for for the pictures or the final week. It's a lifestyle, right? Continue on. Who says it has to end here? Keep it going, um, and and really just just make it a lifestyle change and, and keep working with it. Yeah, and that's one of the things I, I kind of want to point out. The thing is, like, if you look at Body Model Com, Body Model Coms, this is why I love working with them. This is why I like we do a lot of experiments, and we like the first people to know about it are the people on Body Model Com. And the reason why is because having sat with them, having to talk with the people about Body Model Com, they're passionate. It's for them, for everyone about MLCOM, it's not just, um, you know, this transformation. We want you to do this transformation for the lifestyle 
And so one thing I would definitely recommend is when you're done with this 12-week, Bodymail.com has a really cool new feature on where you go on and you enter in like, oh, this is my information. Um, this is what my goals are. And they'll give you a customized workout. They put so much effort into providing valuable information from experts from around the world. So, like I said, I wouldn't crash on the last 12 weeks, but this is time for you to celebrate and say, man, I did it. I made it through 12 weeks. It's not, not everyone does, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a big accomplishment, and it's just a step into a whole new life for you guys. Um, but, yes, you have inspired us tremendously. Um, this is a good question. Here. Um, <clears throat> this one by Michelle. Um, I work on the AM um, and really pushing it. I'm wondering if I added more workouts in the PM, would I be breaking down more muscle or making more, i.e. doing cardio or weightlifting? Does it make a difference with what I do? Great right question. Yeah, so, so, um, I'm wondering, oops, so, yeah, so basically the question is, you know, I'm wondering if I added more workouts in the PM. Uh, so basically so, you're talking yeah. about two-a-days. Mm -hmm. Michelle, two-a-days... Um, are real interesting, and the first person to study two a days was a guy named Hakkinen um, out of your vascular Finland again. I talked about Hakkinen earlier. So what Hakkinen did was he took um, elite weightlifters, and actually it was female weightlifters, and um, they were say they were doing ten sets of squats in the AM. He had them do five in the AM, and then five in the PM. Okay, so five five in the morning, five at night instead of ten in the morning. The ones that did five in the morning, five at night made more total gains in muscle mass, more total gains in strength. Now, why is this the case? When you're untrained, protein synthesis lasts for like 72 hours, maybe up to 96. However, when you're highly trained, protein synthesis could be back down to baseline in hours, like six hours, eight hours. Well, at night, guess what? That workout's not doing anything anymore, okay? So if you split your workout volume up and you train half in the morning, half at night, you'd make far better gains. Mm -hmm. um, so now, if you did the same workout, if you did a huge workout in the morning and added an entirely new workout in the night, you could overreach, mm -hmm. and you have sure. to be careful with that. So one of the things that we do is we talk about period, you periodize your volume. Yep, and, and you definitely periodize your volume to periods of high and low, and this is something that we've been working with a lot. So some weeks, um, for instance, we're, we're experimenting this on ourselves right now. Some weeks, you do two-a-days. Um, every day, but obviously you're going to split that volume, you know, one into the morning, half of it in the morning, half of it at night. Um, and then once you adapt to that kind of uh, rep routine of these two a days and splitting the volume, maybe then the next week you go back to one a days and you jam all the volume into that one workout. And then maybe you do two a days uh, on Monday, a one on on Tuesday, two a day on Wednesday. Periodizing your frequency and your volume is going to is kind of next level. It's kind of really where the next level of, of periodization and, and kind of workout routines are going to go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you give some tips for hard gainers? <laughs> um, this is a uh, sorry. Nice. So, um, well, okay. Quick tips. Um, okay. No, <clears throat> number one thing is set goals that are attainable. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so you want an overall goal. Okay, sorry. So let's say, for example, I don't know what you weigh. Say you weigh 150, you're like, I want to weigh 200. You don't want to say that it's March now, I want to weigh 200 pounds in April. Okay? You know, you want, yes, I just talked about we don't know a limit to growth, but in the same token, if you're a hard gainer and you know your body at this point, um, you want to set goals that are just outside of your reach, just outside of your comfort zone. Set stuff that you think you can get, um, but obviously keep it in reason. So maybe you're like, I want to put on a pound a week or, you know, or half to one pound a week. I think that's a solid goal because look at that at the end of the year, all of a sudden you've got a lot of mass, right? And number two, um, <clears throat> you know, track your calories. Track your calories. A lot of people are like, I'm eating a lot. I'm eating a lot. You track People come into our lab all the time, I'm eating a lot. Man. And we track their calories, and they're like eating 2,200 calories. If you're a hard gainer, you need to know what your baseline is. You need to raise those calories. Start by raising them by 500. Okay, uh, um, um, per day. If that doesn't work and you're tracking that consistently, add another 500. Okay. Um, on top of that, I recommend. I wouldn't recommend a bro split. Don't train every body part once a week. Train it at least three times a week. Okay. Stick with the mass builders: squats, bench press, deadlifts, bent over rows. You hit a lot of mass. Change exercises up frequently. Do not stick with just the same exercise. If you want maximal growth, maximal symmetry. 
Like I said, Dr. Omari Salza fed, saw that that was by changing up exercise selection. Maximize all the mechanisms of hypertrophy. Have heavy days. Have um, um, days where you're doing 8 to 12 reps, short rest period lengths to met for metabolic stress. Have blood flow restriction days. Hit all the mechanisms of hypertrophy that you possibly can. You know, make sure you're hitting um, um, at least 30 grams of protein at every single meal. Um, <clears throat> once all of that is in place, look at Body Model Calm. Incorporate a, a lot of the tri-true tri supplements um, like branched amino acids, like HMB, like creatine. Um, make sure, like Ryan said earlier, you are sleeping. Mm. You grow when you're sleeping and in the kitchen, right? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I know what you guys are thinking right now, but still, uh, um, we're working hard and losing sleep so you guys can grow. Okay, so do that as a favor. Grow um, by sleeping. Yeah. Um, something cool, kind of, kind of playing off that. Dr. Wilson talked about goal setting, um, and now at the end of the twelve weeks is is coming to a close. Um, everyone's gonna probably set some new goals, and this is a really cool experiment. Something that that we've been we've been watching uh, some videos by Jordan Belfort. Um, and it's kind of really cool. So one of the things he does is he says, he looks out to the audience, he says, raise your arm as high as you can. So everyone raises their arm. And then he goes, I'll just raise a little bit more. He's like, why'd you raise a little bit more? He's like, I said raise it as high as you can. And then you went and he goes, that extra inch that you, that, that you raised it, he goes, that's what separates people, that, that little inch of you raising mm -hmm. that a little bit more. If at the beginning, now you're looking at it and you set your goal, just beyond your, your comfort zone. You, you, have a real, you have a goal that's realistic, and you put it a little bit further, right beyond your comfort zone. That's the goal you want to attack. That's what's going to keep you hungry. That's what's going to separate you um, and really help you to, to, to get to that goal and keep you focused and say, you know what? I'm not going to stop until I get to that goal, and you guys have the ability to do that. And, and we, we, uh, we're going to be here, uh, even after these 12 weeks, we're going to be here to help you guys Forever, 100%, on, on and on. 100. That's it, right there. Power of the mind, guys. Right. That's it. Um, hello, uh, Dr. Wilson. I wanted to ask you about ketogenic diet, and I want to make sure I will be on the right path. Um, okay, this is Amir. Uh, please, if possible, shed more light on this diet, and please explain how should I approach it and what food items I can take. Okay, so we're running out of time, so we're going to make this real quick. Get something where you can track your calories, all right? That's the first thing you need to do, all right? Number one. Number two, 75%, 70 75% of your calorie intake should be from fat. You do not want to do like, oh, I'm going to go real low carb, but I'm going to go moderate fat. That's not going to work, okay? You should be eating like bacon, blue cheese, whole fat ranch, butter, oil, all of that stuff. 70 to 75% of your diet must be fat. 20% should be protein. 5% should be carbs. That's my best advice. Get some medium chain triglycerides. Only take your time starting to take them because your stomach will hurt. Eat coconut oil. Um, you know, heavy cream. Things like that. That's my best advice. And realize that it's going to take time to adapt. The first week you're going to feel horrible. Taking coconut oil will help you through that week. And... Um, it's, but it's going to take you at least two weeks before you start feeling like, boom, I'm ready to go. Let's get this done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some foods, some foods, just to give you a quick overview of what a day <clears throat> might look like. Uh, eggs and bacon with some cheese in the morning. Um, for lunch, maybe like a fattier cut of meat um, with some, with some uh, vegetables. And then with dinner, maybe like a steak with some mashed cauliflower, which is delicious, um, with, maybe with some cream and butter in it. Um, those are kind of the, kind of what like a typical day would, would look like. Yeah, perfect. All right, this is the last question. Um, okay. After this, I'm going to go present uh, on concurrent training. Yeah. So um, I just finished Project Mass. This is Colin. Colin, boom, good work, buddy. Colin Lesman right there. Uh, I just finished Project Mass. Um, I'm feeling massive, and I gained <laughs> 10 pounds while also losing 1% body fat. Boom! That's awesome, man. That's Project great. Shred People see. Pro yeah, yeah. Very good question. <laughs> Is Project Shred coming soon? That's a really uh, good uh, question. Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, I know. So, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna get on the phone with uh, my good friend Lawrence Ballinger after this, um, bodybuilding.com, and uh, I know we got to make it happen. So that's that is the, definitely the next project. We are prepping for that seriously. 
Mm -hmm. um, the thing about Project Shred is we need to make this the most advanced, scientifically advanced, phenomenal shredding program ever. But yes, it is coming soon. It is. And, and one thing I'll give you guys <laughs> some, some insight on is that ever since we finished with Project Mass, we've kind of been prepping for Project Shred. Um, and it has it's it's been months in the making because, like Dr. Wilson said, we want to give you guys the best of the best. When we talk about insulin sensitivity, we're going to give you the latest that we have to offer on insulin sensitivity, fat metabolism, everything that you can think of on, on how to really optimize your body composition and shred. That's what we're, that's what we're hoping to bring to the that's table. What we're, right now, if I ask you, what are the mechanisms of hypertrophy, right? Oh, cell swelling, you know, um, metabolic stress, you know, uh, motor unit recruitment. That's what we want you to wrap right? Boom. That's what we're going to bring in Project Shred. What are the mechanisms of insulin sensitivity driving your nutrients towards skeletal muscle away from fat, right? Boom. That's what we're going to bring to you. So we're definitely working on it, Cole, and we appreciate your support. And um, I said, that's that's the uh, last question uh, for the day. Guys, we really appreciate your time. Um, tonight, we're going to be on Instagram at the Muscle Prof at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We're going to be answering your questions right here. I got my phone ready to go. Um, you know, we'll be answering your questions live there. Like I said, I really appreciate you guys' support. I appreciate you guys coming out, and um, we'll see you tonight. Yeah, and guys, remember, remember, the next week, keep us posted with your pictures. Uh, we, we love it. We love seeing the, getting some feedback. Love you guys posting posting the progress pictures. And remember, after these 12 weeks, we're here. We're here for with you for the rest of your, your lives and the rest of our lives. We're we're here to make this change together. So it doesn't end after these twelve weeks. Just just keep it going. That's it, guys. We'll catch you later. See you tonight.